Why are the Jewish people in Israel today? Is it random? Is it a coincidence? Or is it destiny? What's happening in Israel today is the culmination of Jewish history. For almost 4,000 years, the Jewish people have been living on faith. Faith in prophecies given thousands of years ago. Promises that seem irrational, promises that seem almost impossible. Every prophecy dependent on the next, if one isn't true, none of them are true. Every single one of them is coming to pass in our lifetime. Every single one of them. The first promise to Israel was made to Abraham, an eternal covenant. And I shall establish a covenant between me and you, and between your offspring after you throughout their generations, as an everlasting covenant. The Jewish people are the only ancient people alive today. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, all of them are gone. Well, no nation has survived such scattering and then remained a nation. And they became assimilated and eventually uh, any trace of the original was gone. We, an eternal people, stand alive today. We also know that if the Jewish people don't live a godly life in the land of Israel, we're promised to be scattered to four corners of the earth. Which is, you know, guaranteed to cause an extinction of any people. Scatter people around the world, they're going to be gone. The last thing you would want to do to an eternal people is to scatter them across the world with no common culture, no common language, no internet, no forms of communication. How will the Jewish people stay Jewish? How will we stay eternal if we're scattered across the world? And yet, that's exactly what happened. We remain the people, not only just a faith or religion, but a family. God will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number. The most recent census numbers the Chinese people at 1.3 billion, plus or minus 12 million. 12 million, that's the entire number of all of the Jewish people worldwide. We're a statistical error when just counting the people in China. That's how small we are. The fact that we're scattered and small and we've been subject to the greatest hatred in human history. The Torah tells us the atrocities and the curses that would come upon the Jewish people throughout the exile. And you I will scatter among the nations. I will unsheathe the sword after you. No one has suffered as we have suffered. No one has been as persecuted. Anti-Semitism, the oldest, most universal, intense, irrational hatred in the world. If it was pogroms, crusades, the Inquisition, Muslim oppression, nation after nation, religion after religion. And the persecution we faced has always transcended all logic and rational thought. When we were poor and destitute in the shtetl, we were hated for being parasites. When wealthy, for being money-grubbing. One thing that we could always rely on is that there would always be a reason, a pretext, to hate us. And despite all the persecution, not only have we survived, but we've thrived. Now imagine that, a tiny, persecuted, scattered people. Out of all nations, how are they supposed to shift global consciousness? The same nation that everyone's going to hate is going to be scattered around the world and shouldn't even be here is told we're going to be a light to nations? You know, those two things don't go together. You know, we shouldn't even be here, much less impact the world. Uh, here is a people that uh, small in number that has influenced the world in uh, unbelievable fashion. Well, the science and all the wonderful things that they contribute to the rest of the world, wherever they find themselves in any country, they become the lifeblood of that country. They're an extraordinary energy. And you can literally see a direct correlation between countries that have Jews in them and how they treat the Jews and how those countries do in terms of their political development, their scientific development, their technological development. The Torah tells us that if the Jews don't do their charge, so they will be sent out of the land, and while they're away, the land will become desolate. All the land in the late 1800s was burned for the rocks. We couldn't produce anything here. Mark Twain came here in 1850. He talks about all these places that he tried to pay respects to. He was sad, saddened by the fact that it was a desolation. Nothing grew here. 
The land would lay desolate, and your foes who dwell upon it will be desolate. Now to understand the impossibility of that promise, you have to understand the geographic map of Biblical Israel. All the ancient pathways cross through Israel. Every empire throughout the last 2,000 years tried to settle the land of Israel. Babylonia, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, the British, all of these empires with all of their wealth and all of their resources tried and all of them failed. So you think land is land. Either it will be fertile or desolate. Either it will bear fruit or not. But the land of Israel plays by an entirely different set of rules. Then we're told that when the Jews return to the land of Israel, the land will start to flourish again. It'll blossom. Just as the people have been revived, the land has been revived. The land of Israel responds to the people of Israel. The land didn't change, it returned to itself. The blood rushed to its cheeks and the color returned to its eyes. The fruit had a vibrance of color like it hadn't in thousands of years. And the Jewish people, we've returned to ourselves as well. We're finally tending the soil and working the land once again. It's a living miracle. Those people who spent their whole lives irrigating and digging an oasis out of this desert. gathering of the exiles, it's the most prophesied event in the Bible. It's mentioned over 40 times, unprecedented in history, never before has a nation been scattered across the world and then in gathered to its ancient homeland. And yet every single prophet mentions this miraculous feat that will happen. Behold, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, the pregnant and the birthing together. A great congregation will return here. And now they have been returned to the land. And the land is still carrying the names of the great history of this people. It's unbelievable. Today in Israel, you see universalism. Jews from Ethiopia, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, Russia, the entire world has now returned to the land of Israel. The prophets tell us that the Hebrew language will eventually be revived. When's the last time you saw a Phoenician English dictionary? Probably not for a while because Phoenician is a dead language. You know what language they speak in Latin America? It's not Latin because Latin too is a dead language. Never before in world history has a dead language been revived and brought back to life before the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and the revival of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew was always uh, preserved in rabbinic writings and the prayer service, but it was not the lingua franca, it isn't what people spoke. We are appreciative of a whole country of close to six million people today who speak a language which no one spoke a hundred years ago. It's resurrected, like the Jewish people back in their homeland. Now after the most inspiring comeback story in world history, after building the most moral and innovative democracy in the entire Middle East, you'd think that Israel would be supported and held up as an example. But we see that the UN, a representation of all the nations in the world, condemn Israel far more than any other country on the planet and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The only country in the world that it's being called, its destruction is being called for by, by a member state of the United Nations. That its national movement Zionism was declared racist and illegal by the United Nations. That its capital city, which is arguably the oldest capital of any country in the world, is not recognized by any country. And there's many, many more points. In those days it will happen that ten men from all the languages of the nations will take hold of the corner of the garment of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. 
today with such abundant materialism, there's an unprecedented spiritual thirst. Israel was founded three years after the Holocaust. Three years after 70% of the Jews were destroyed in what is exponentially the largest slaughter of any people in human history, the remnant trickle back against the will of the British, okay, with no support from the world, into a desert piece of real estate with no natural resources, no infrastructure, surrounded by millions of hostile Arabs in a constant state of warfare, terrorism, economic blockade. And think about it, within a few years, the desert is exporting fruits and vegetables to the rest of the world. That Israel is the only country in the world that has more trees at the end of the 20th century than the beginning. In terms of high tech per capita, the most in the world is in Israel. Done in less than 40 years, with no natural resources, constant war, terrorism, economic blockade. It's unbelievable, but people just don't see it because we've gotten used to it. It's Jewish history. It's all supernatural. We were given these visions and promises thousands of years ago for our time and for our generation. Every single promise has come to pass. And the challenges we face today are part of a greater plan. Biblical destiny, human destiny, is unfolding today in Israel. A worldwide movement is growing stronger every day. And it is your opportunity to join the greatest revolution in human history, Israel.